And Christina starts us off. And if she laughs, just she'll get it. Don't worry. <laughs> Warning, this show may be triggering for anybody experiencing gambling related harm. Please watch cautiously. We speak from our experiences only. Please seek professional help for a gambling addiction. This is the Bet Free Life. I'm Christina, and I haven't placed a bet since March of 2021. And I'm Brian, and I haven't placed a bet since July of 2014. Hi, Christina. Hi, Brian. Christina, we're going to just skip over the nice stuff that we say to each other all the time and go right into our interview today. Sounds great. I'll just text it to you later. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so today on the show from Brain Connections in Canada, we have Deirdre Horney, who is a gambling counselor for the past 22 years, working with individuals, groups, couples, and families of people concerned about their gambling and other behavioral addictions, as well as Dr. Dearis Belotis, who is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster University, also the associate director of the Peter Boris Center for Addictions Research, and her lab, the Integrated Neuroscience of Motivation and Change Laboratory, has a research stream focused on understanding the neurobiology and the cognitive process underlying gambling disorder. So what have you done today? Because that was a lot of stuff. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you both? Good. Well, well, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Christina, for having us on the Bet Free Life to talk about our project, which is Brain Connections. Uh, Brian, we really enjoyed being on your podcast before. And Christina, we're just delighted to be speaking with you as well. You are reaching so many people who need to hear this message of hope that you're giving. And also, hopefully, uh, we'll find the resources at brainconnections.ca helpful. So we're happy to be here. Yeah, so glad to have you guys on. I'm really excited about this. I said it four times before we started recording. Um, but when I first saw this this project that you guys have been working on, it's yeah, it's it really changed. It really kind of opened a lane of thinking for me that I wasn't necessarily uh, going down. So thank you well, so this, much. This is music to our ears, isn't it, Iris? That this is what we were hoping that people would um, not only enjoy the resources, but it, for some people we have to say they've been life-changing, right? Really reducing the stigma around gambling addiction and helping people understand what's happening so they don't blame themselves in the way that you often hear, at least in my own practice, I hear that so often. Yeah, so we thought maybe we'd tell you a bit more about Brain Connections before we see the video. Does that sound yeah, good? Yeah, absolutely. That'd absolutely. Okay. I'll talk from my perspective as the kind of problem gambling counselor clinician perspective. So um, Brian, as you said, I've been doing this for 22 years. So over the years, I've had many, many questions from my clients about the brain and problem gambling. Things like, um, is gambling addiction just like a substance use addiction? Like, are they the same kind of thing? Why do I keep gambling um, even when it's not fun anymore? Why is it hard to say no to an urge, even though I really want to say no? Since I've stopped gambling, everything's like, meh, nothing feels fun anymore. Am I just going to switch addictions? Is it going to be gambling now and substance use tomorrow and gaming the next day? Like, what's going on there? These are great questions. And I... Before Iris, before Brain Connections, I did my best to answer them with what I knew, what I'd been trained to say, what coworkers told me, what clients told me, what I picked up at conferences. And, you know, so I had this kind of pat work, patchwork answer and I would serve it up in the hopes that it would be helpful. Um, but in the end, I learned later after talking with Iris that not everything that I was saying was actually grounded in the literature. And so... One of the most common misunderstandings is what Iris and I like to call the dopamine story. And in the substance use field, there's, uh, you know, there's a, a story about how dopamine is linked to addiction, which is very much true in the substance use field. And for many, if there are clinicians out there listening, you might have been trained in, in working with folks who have substance use problems before you started working in the field of gambling. And so you might just as I did, think, oh, I can just transfer that information over. It's all the same, right? Uh, but that turns out that's not necessarily true. So when Iris, who just started up her uh, research hub at that time, she came to our um, clinic and said, is there anything I can do for you? And after we were floored by that question, because we never get asked that question, um, uh, we said, well, actually, what would be so great is to have some handouts that was actually based in the literature so that people, when we were giving out information and answering those questions, we knew that what we were saying was actually true. And that's how Brain Connections came to be. So, um, and it's evolved a lot since 
then, um, but it is being used now in treatment centers, in individual counseling centers, in schools, in other settings. It's all over the place. And so we're so happy that you're going to help us spread the word about these resources so that all of your viewers get a chance to look as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's so nice to get feedback now from other people and hear the reach that it's having, that people all across North America and the world are are seeing our little video and and uh, and connecting with the message. Such Sorry. a good visual model. I've I've watched it three times today already. And every time I do, uh, I I just learn something new. And so I'm I think we're excited to share it. I, I think we should show it now because we keep talking about it and everyone's okay. probably wondering what it looks like. Um, so good. enjoy this video from Brain Connections about gambling disorder. Gambling. At first, it can feel a bit like getting behind the wheel of a new car. You're excited, confident, and in control. When you win, you feel on top of the world. There's nothing to worry about. So what's happening in your brain when you're gambling? The reward hub in your brain is like the gas pedal in your car. It gives the go signal to move towards what you want. The top-down control network is like the brakes in your car. It gives a signal to slow down or stop what you're doing. How are you doing? Everything good? Addiction is like a communication problem between these gas and brake pedals. You keep pressing on the gas, but when it's time to stop, the brakes might not work. By the time you realize that gambling has become a problem, it can be difficult to stop. Gambling is now a habit. Habits are formed when brain activity shifts away from conscious control. You might feel like you're on autopilot. Once habit has taken over, you become very aware of gambling cues and triggers. Gambling isn't as fun, but you continue to do it to escape those uncomfortable urges caused by those triggers. As the consequences of your gambling get worse, so does your mood. At first, gambling has a positive effect on your mood, but in addiction, your natural mood set point drops. Over time, gambling becomes less pleasurable and your set point lowers, even when you aren't gambling. It can lead to depression. Hey, are you worried about your gambling? This helped me, and it might help you. Have a look. The good news is that your brain is always changing, and you can reset your reward pathways. With help and support, you can stay motivated and develop a rich and meaningful life. For more information about the brain and problem gambling, visit brainconnections.ca. There is help. There is hope. So there you have it. There was our video. And so as you saw, it was it's a brief color animated video that uses that driving metaphor to help people understand the neurobiology of problem gambling. And the reason that we even did this is because our feedback early on after we developed these clinical handouts, which was the first iteration of our project, um, our client said, could you make this into a video? <laughs> and Nears and I were like, yeah, I think we could do that. And so we had to get funding again to do that. So our first round of funding was for the clinical handouts. And so we applied again to GRIO, um, shout out to GRIO, um, Gambling Research Exchange Ontario, for giving us the funding to even do this. And so, um, so that's how that came to be. And our main character, uh, we, we, call, we call the character B for brain emoji, because uh, early on we said we, we need some kind of character to do this video, you know, and it was like, well, it's a brain. We're talking about the brain. So can we make a character that's about, that looks like a brain? So we call um, the character B. Uh, a B is gender neutral, could be female or male. Um, and so um, when we refer to B, that's what we're talking about. B is the main character. You can see it's a short video, but a lot went into creating it. So the first thing we had to do was write a script that was an accurate explanation, more accurate than the dopamine story that I was talking to you about before. And so the dopamine story is that it's a, it, that 
gambling addiction is about an, an excess of dopamine in the brain that you you get hooked on that dopamine and then you want the hit of dopamine and that's why you keep gambling and you crave it and when you don't have it you're in withdrawal like that's the, a nice little story that that you hear quite often actually about addiction and certainly about gambling but the research doesn't bear that out and I'll turn that over to Iris to tell us about that Unfortunately, it doesn't. It's such a nice story and you you want it to be true, but it's probably come down through the substance use disorder literature, which is consistent in showing depletion of dopamine in the brain after chronic use of drugs like uh, like alcohol, stimulants, opiates, etc., But unfortunately, there have been multiple studies uh, looking at dopamine in problem gambling and in gambling disorder populations, and they haven't replicated this finding. It's very inconsistent. Sometimes they even show a surplus of dopamine. And it's uh, unfortunately, it it hasn't uh, it hasn't been uh, consistently replicated. So uh, that's not to say that things couldn't change in the future, that we have we may have better ways of of looking at the brain and understanding dopamine transmission. Dopamine is involved in reward. It is involved in in different motor movements. But uh, this sort of simple story of gambling being a a result of uh, either excess dopamine or too little dopamine, unfortunately, has not uh, has not panned out in the literature so far. And I said to her, well, what are we going to say instead? And that's really where this video came from. What can we say instead? And so as you saw from the video, we use that car analogy instead. Instead of the dopamine story, we use the car metaphor uh, to, to really understand what's going on. So the idea is that people with addictions will press that gas pedal, as you saw it be kind of racing and pressing that gas pedal. And, and they do that to feel pleasure. So that's the gambling, right? So you're pressing that gas pedal. And that refers to the gas pedal is the reward network in your brain, which is the ventral striatum. And you know what? That wouldn't be a problem, really, if your brakes worked. And that's really the crux of the issue here, right? That, you know, if your brakes worked, you could press that gas pedal and confidently know that you could stop whenever you wanted to. But as you both know, um, that's not always the case, right? I mean, that's one of the hallmarks of a gambling addiction is that um, your brakes don't necessarily work. And that's what we know about folks who have addictions is that the brakes are inconsistent. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you don't even know you should stop. You don't even get the signal that says, maybe I shouldn't do this, right? Lots of folks will say, I, for example, driving to the casino, I'm in the casino parking lot, went right in, didn't even occur to me that I maybe shouldn't do that, even though my goal is to not do that. So, so the brain is not picking up the signal necessarily, that stop signal that says maybe you shouldn't do this. And it's also the case that a lot of folks will say, it's not just gambling, but other areas of my life where I don't have breaks. And so it becomes a kind of an overarching problem with the gas and the brake pedal. So, and and to add to that, the complexity of this is that folks with addictions don't always process rewards in the same way as people who don't have addictions. So this business of nothing's exciting, like I was talking to someone this week and I was saying, well, you know, you could read a book, you could have a nice meal, go out with a friend. And that person just said, meh, that's not exciting, meh. So they're not excited by by natural, what we call natural rewards, natural rewards. Iris, you can correct me on this. Natural rewards are like a warm hug, you know, a nice meal, social time, things that will ignite that reward network in a natural way, as opposed to unnatural rewards like substance use or gambling or those sorts of things. So, um, So they're not excited by that. And they have trouble appreciating how a new experience could be enjoyable. So if you say, hey, here's a hundred things you could do. Here's the, you know, the, the list of pleasurable activities or a hundred things you could try. Uh, and they might be like, I don't see how any of that would be fun. It's like they can't process necessarily what's going on there. And so that's the impact of a gambling addiction on the brain. And so what do they end up doing quite often? They go for the unnatural words. They keep pressing that gas pedal just to feel something, just to feel pleasure or just to feel that escape. They push and push that go pedal um, in the ventral striatum. And um, and then, of course, the more addicted you are to gambling, the less break your well, your brakes are going to work. And so it's that awful combination of continuing to press the gas pedal to feel something, anything, and then the, and then it's like, I need to press the brakes now. I'm in trouble. And then it's like, nothing's happening. And you keep going. 
we talked at the beginning a bit, how can we best present this story? And we found that it's the car metaphor that really works best as the beginning point of our script. And, uh, and we really worked hard to find a really good animator who could bring our character to life. And we specifically talked about having a character that was gender neutral, uh, that everyone could relate to, and that you actually cared about when you saw bees distress or brain emojis distress. And this had to all be done within a few seconds to engage with the character very quickly. Um, so creating this, this B character that's universal, relatable, engaging, and still accurate for the messaging um, is not an easy thing. And uh, as we're discussing, a lot went into this. Uh, so some of the imagery was really cha challenging. So first to start, how do, you pe how do you help people understand the metaphor of the car actually being gambling? Uh, just because the the whole movie, the whole movie, the whole video is going to to be about the car racing through. So to make sure that this was clear, we had the word gambling put on the side of the car right at the beginning. And you hear B polishing the car to make it shiny, just like gambling presents itself initially, a shiny, fun, cool red race car. And to demonstrate B's confidence with gambling, we see B put uh, put shades on and expertly race around the driveway and maneuver through all sorts of obstacle, which demonstrates initial skill or at least the feeling of having some sort of skill. And you can also see people on the sidelines who are very envious and admiring of, of B. Um, Sometimes we say he or she, but uh, B tried to be presented as a as a VIP at the beginning, a winner, and and this is how people tend to feel in the winning phase. Everyone's watching them, wanting to be them. They're they're like a celebrity essentially. Uh, so that was, you know, something we very quickly had to get across and at the same time then transition quickly into into someone's life falling apart in within a, a few minutes after that. So throughout the video, you can see B uh, driving the car and the car is slowly degrading. So it gets more scuffed. B looks more and more tired, sort of saggy, saggy eyes. Um, uh, looking sort of foggy holes in the car. And, and then at the end, the whole car becomes undrivable with uh, the sense of control being the last thing to be lost in, in all of this. And you see B ending up holding the steering wheel, uh, just the steering wheel with no car. And this is, I think, the ultimate image of, of having no control. The wheel does nothing, but you might have the illusion of control. So you're sort of still hanging on to the wheel tightly. Uh, and eventually you see B throw the wheel away in a, in a sign of acceptance of the reality and actually take another B's hand. Uh, so two other B's come out at the end and, and uh, give B courage to see the truth. And I think this is a, a very common experience. People's lives are destroyed, but they may still think they can gain control um, or this, they can gain control over the gambling. And it's only when they realize that uh, that they can't, that they sort of throw the steering wheel attached to nothing away that uh, that things can can really change. And then, so following on that idea, we also needed to show uh, that the drive to go gambling. Sometimes we call this video uh, driven to gamble because it, not only is it the driving metaphor, but th that drive that people feel despite everything, despite the consequences. How do we get to show B doing that. And so you'll remember he had a few accidents, some near accidents on the road, but he keeps going, uh, you know, just kind of brushes himself off and readjusts his glasses and keeps going rather than stopping and saying, maybe I shouldn't be driving or slash gambling. Uh, and, and, and he even zooms by a rest stop uh, after a few pot potholes that he hits. And even that's an opportunity to kind of pull over and say, maybe this isn't going well, or maybe I should stop. But no, he just keeps on going. Uh, rather than being mindful and refueling, he keeps driving. And there's even this crossroads where he can choose to go home, or he can choose the flashy VIP good time sign. Uh, and he, he doesn't even look, he doesn't even look at going home, he just kind of keeps going. Um, and, and that's often the case when people are at that crossroads. Do I, I mean, literally people tell me I'm on that highway and it's like, which way am I going? Am I going home 
or am I going to the gambling venue? Which way am I going? And it's even up to the last minute, it's still a debate, right? Uh, and so we wanted to show that in, in our video that that um, that there are these opportunities for people to slow down and become mindful. But when you're in the throes of that addiction, it's like you don't even see it and how scary that is, right? Absolutely. And, and then we wanted to talk about like, how do you, the different phases, how do you go from this confidence to your life falling apart? Again, as you said, in under two minutes, how do we, how do we show that whole thing happening? Although it feels, it often feels to people like it only happened in two minutes. Like I, what happened to me gambling normally, right? Where, where did that go? And then all of a sudden my life was falling apart. You'll notice that in the final phase, so there's that confidence and, you know, people admiring him, but in that final phase, when, when all the parts of the car are falling apart, it happens really fast. And in fact, we got feedback about that. People were like, whoa, that went really fast, but it was on purpose because that is how it is when you have a gambling problem. And when it's really bad, it's like, you're, you know, one of my clients referred to it as like a nuclear wasteland, <laughs> like the, your life blows up and it happens really fast. So the scene is really quick because that loss of control is really fast and, and you can't keep up with the damage. You can't keep up with what's happening. It is happening in front of you and it's like you don't have a hold on it anymore. And then we wondered about how do we depict this notion of autopilot? Countless times people have said, I was in a fog or just, you know, I don't even know how I got there. I don't even know. Like, And when I asked, well, what happened just before? I have no idea what happened just before. So we needed to depict that part. Uh, and so in concert with our animators, we we were like, okay, we've got to have B with these spacey, googly eyes and like that little bit of drool. You might remember the bit of drool that's coming down. And so to show his loss of self-awareness and awareness of his environment and the risk that he was taking. So he's driving and his guys are all Googling and like the drools and he doesn't even see where he's at risk, which is so true to people's experience in my experience anyway. When you talk about the the days or the, the autopilot thing, I have heard so many stories. Um, I, I wasn't personally so much affected. Like, I mean, yeah, I was like completely out of check, but um, where like people have been sitting in, in a casino and somebody has come in and robbed the casino and they didn't, they couldn't even tell you a description of who it was that did it. And it could have literally just been six, six feet away. And they couldn't, some of them don't, didn't even lift their heads. Like I've heard stories of just like commotions or fights or something. And people that were literally right there that could have been witnesses couldn't even tell you the color of somebody's hair, what shirt they were wearing, because they're so locked in to this addiction and, and what they're doing that they came and break that and that's just one of the many connections. Um, but I just wanted to share that because when you said that it was like, bam, that's exactly it. Like you could go into like this zombie state um, thing where you just don't even know what's going on around you. So it's so accurate. And, you know, that um, often my folks will call it the zone. They're in the zone and they and here's the double edged sword. They want to be in the zone. It's the escape for some that they're after. And that zone is a comfort. It's a sanctuary. It's a place where no problems, no issues, nothing enters. And um, I have to say, particularly when I talk to women, uh, that that is a pretty common thing The the pressures of parenthood of, you know, working of life being a woman, right? Uh, they are looking for that sanctuary and the zone is precious. Uh, and at the same time, as you say, that lack of awareness, it's big trouble. Absolutely. It's lack of both self-awareness and then of your environment too. So not being sensitive to things going on. And and I think, I hope that, you know, the, the sort of brain fog, so to speak, in the in the car really depicts that, that even though B's driving really fast, there's all this stuff flying by, B just sits sort of motionless as if as if it wasn't speeding by that quickly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have notes whenever we get to the back into this, I'm going to show you what my depiction, uh, because everything in this video is like, I saw my version of, I'm a very visual person. But I, I'll show you, I'll, I'll share as a, as a compulsive gambler and somebody kind of like my depiction of, of what it, what it's like. I'm um, just writing notes as you guys go through, but yeah, I'm still, I'm still just like the, how accurate this video is on the way that I would say a majority 
of, you know, we all have different stories, different versions of, of our gambling. Some, some didn't gamble as bad, some gambled worse. Um, but there's a, a commonality there across the video where I, I would imagine each, uh, most gamblers could connect across the board. I've, I've got goosebumps right now. I'm so happy to hear that, right? That this, is what we, hear. this is what we were hoping, right? That yeah. that what our understanding and the things we've heard over the years and what the research is telling us, if we can get that across and have people go, yeah, that that is how it is. And in so doing, that takes some of the stigma away, right? That it's not you're a bad person. It's not that you're weak. It's none of that, right? It's that there's actual changes in your brain responsible for what's going on, which is why... Uh, willpower is not often enough, right? That you need other strategies and supports to help get you where you want to go. Because uh, that, that you know, the brain has changed and we can't just rely on what we used to do. Maybe willpower was enough before addiction took hold, but not necessarily afterwards. You'll notice then in the video, we had these infographic moments. We had, you know, um, you know a box would come up, uh, the one for liking versus wanting, and the one for the mood set points where you had the little faces about how your mood declines. Uh, and then we also... Um, laughed quite hard about this, but uh, having going into B, who is a brain, going into his brain, but he's a brain. So there's like the meta brain going on here. Uh, and so we it thought, well, we have like, should, should it just be, should we have him have a little brain inside or should yeah. the whole body <laughs> should his whole body be a yeah. depiction? Like these are the types of details that we agonize over. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to say is, is about this business of when gambling loses its veneer, when people go from the fantasy of what gambling is to the reality, how do we depict that? It's very delicate to do this because what you don't want anyone thinking is that if you go into recovery, that the fun is over. It, it couldn't be further from the truth, right? Gambling, when you have an addiction, it's not fun anymore, right? There's, you know, it's, it, there's a fantasy about what it is. There's a fantasy that it will be an escape or fun or fabulous or whatever the, whatever the fantasy is, or you're going to win. Um, and, and we know if you're in addiction that that's just not true. Um, and so what we had, what we decided on in the end was to, to have that, the fun happiness sign, which is what gambling always promises, right? It promises that, uh, start to fall apart and start to reveal its true self, right? Its true nature. And for B to see that as he comes to the reality and to choose a different path, to choose recovery. He's picking something that's hard work, which recovery is. Um, but we didn't want people thinking that he's leaving fun and happiness in favor of the boring work of recovery. That would be the worst takeaway. We wanted people to know that he's not leaving fun and happiness. He's going towards hope. He's going towards a better life. Uh, that fun and happiness just doesn't exist with gambling anymore for him, that he needs to go somewhere else to find that, even if it's hard work, even if it takes every ounce of effort he has to put down the wheel and go and with the other bees cheering him on. Uh, so that, that, that whole thing, that took a lot of thought about how do we make sure that people don't think that recovery or making a change, however you want to put it, is, is all work and no play. I'll talk a bit about a uh, very practical aspect of, of doing this type of knowledge translation work, which is uh, the budget and a little bit about the, the budget dilemma that, uh, that we had early on in, in starting this. Um, we had several proposals within our budget, but the one that really stood out to us was the, the most expensive. And so we had to, we, we had this dilemma right from the beginning, um, uh, you know, should we go with our gut or, or save the budget and maybe, you know, use, uh, use some of the budget to, to do other things as well. Um, and in the end, we, we discussed this at great length and we decided to go with our gut and hired a wonderful husband and wife team at Bells on Studios. And Matt, the animator and his wife, the script editor, Drew B as part of their proposal. And we just fell in love with B right away. And it was it was hard for us to, to look at anything else after that. And, and that was what we knew had to be the core, that you have to connect with this character immediately. And um, there was still a lot of back and forth that happened with B to, to make B look more like a brain and less like a peach or a piece of fruit or something edible. <laughs> Um, 
but I, I hope that in the end we got the character, um, we got the character right. I think Matt did this amazing job in, in depicting B and, and was really key in, in developing the video then. And uh, so we, we had to scale back our vision to afford them. But I, I think in the end, they, they were very much worth, uh, they were worth it. And, and the video shortening it in the end, I think was even an advantage because um, I think we had originally thought of like a five or a 10 minute video but there's something about getting the message out uh, in a succinct way and people often click away if if the if the video goes on for too long so i think uh in the end we definitely feel like we made the best choice with uh with bells on studios and once they were on board we had to make sure that the video was short enough to keep people's attention uh even though Deirdre and I had developed a much, much longer script. As you can see, we're, we're, uh, we're very verbose and <laughs> like to talk about everything. Um, so we had to have the right imagery that expressed our thoughts and even the right music to go with the, the ups and downs of, of the gambling experience. And we also hired uh, an actress, uh, Val Cole, to be our narrator. And she worked diligently to get the tone just right. Uh, so no judgment, no shame and just enough hopefulness so that people would know that change is possible. And so there were a lot of considerations and, and subtleties that, that went into this. We actually did listen to different voices and, and try and think about what, what do we want to convey in, in the only narrator that we have here. So we also really wanted to have some kind of focus on family members and loved ones in the vid video. Originally, we had designed B to have a partner who was affected by the gambling and B's partner was meant to, to wave goodbye at the beginning as B leaves. And then we would see the partner missing B and feeling the impact of B's gambling. But we couldn't afford all these extra characters and subplots and side, side stories. Uh, so we wouldn't have had the time to do uh, a partner justice in the video. So we got creative and, and we ended up doing two things. Uh, we have other bees at the end of the video encouraging uh, B to get help. Uh, so this represents what loved ones can do when someone has a gambling problem. But we deliberately, and, and we discussed this quite a bit at the end as well, uh, we had B walking to get help alone because in the end, the individual needs to change and they need to do this on their own. There are other people uh, that are supporting B, but uh, forcing the change is never successful. There are people that can, that can help and support, uh, but the ultimate walk uh, is on your own. So the ultimate choice. Uh, so you might also have picked up on the, the second thing that we did in the video, which was that the narrator ends up becoming part of the story. So first she asks B at, at a point early in the video, are you okay? After he has a, a B has a very close call at the, at a stoplight. And this is very much like friends or family asking you if you're okay after a, a big gambling binge. And then later, she reveals that she's in recovery too. So this was to demonstrate that a gambling problem can happen to anyone, and you likely would never know. Uh, would you ever guess that the gambling, uh, sorry, that the narrator is someone in gambling recovery? Likely not. Uh, but she lends B a hand, much as a sponsor or a trusted friend would, when their car or their life completely breaks down. What sticks out to me the most in the video, the thing that, that I can relate to, I should say the most, is the liking versus wanting about gambling. And I feel like I went through that on a nightly basis, even, where it was, I walked in and, and oh, man, I love gambling and I really want to be here. And then eventually it's, boy, I don't really want to be here, but I can't stop gambling um, I've got to win my money back. And then sometimes there'd be a late win with my last dollar. And then it was, oh, I love gambling again. And I really want to be here. And, and I wouldn't leave with the winnings because I still really wanted to then gamble again. And it, it was just this endless cycle of liking and wanting and then hating and being sick by gambling. And so I, I, I thought that was an interesting point that I don't, I don't really think of a lot about my gambling, what I was thinking, all I could think was, I'm, I'm gambling, I want to be gambling. And that's as simple as it was for me. 
I didn't realize there was wanting and liking and those intersected and intertwined. Yeah. And I think that speaks to um, some changes in the way we conceptualize different aspects of addiction over the past few decades. So some researchers, I think it was in the 90s, separated those two, liking and wanting. And you can think of wanting as being congruent with, with what you actually want, but then you can also think of wanting as something that you don't actually want. So for example, craving, you may crave uh, a, a substance, or you may have all these urges uh, to gamble, but you don't actually want to, uh, you know, you may recognize problems happening, it may not be the right time, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and so this, this aspect of separating the, the outcome or the consumption of a reward with the anticipation of it, the craving, the, the feeling of need or urge, I think is a, is a really important one. And, and, and um, I think researchers are, are following quite closely. And, and it turns out in the brain that there are different mechanisms that seem to underlie the wanting and the liking as well. And then I, I am, I got to ask, how how long would this have been an eight part miniseries if you would have had the budget for it? <laughs> That's a good question. I I your film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, our original script was ten pages, wasn't it? And then we had to get down to three or something. Like, oh was... goodness. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Talk uh, about kill your editor, darlings. Yeah, I know, I know. The script editor is like, this is way too long. You got way too much in here, and we're like, oh, yeah. Exactly. And it, was, it was good to have someone else come in and, and yeah. edit it down because we were like, no, that's a great line. That's a, but mm -hmm. when she, she really got to, this is the main message. Let's keep focused on this. And I think she had a good idea with the imagery, how we could uh, pair it up. So one of the nicest things for me of working with Iris is I would, I would present her with what people were telling me, like what you're saying, uh, you know, the, this business of, I, I don't like gambling anymore, but I want it. Or uh, my mood just gets lower and lower uh, or nothing feels fun anymore. I would present her with these things and she'd be like, oh yeah, well that's anhedonia or that's the set point or that's, and I'd be like, oh, <laughs> there's a, there, well, okay, tell me more about what, about what the research is. Like the, brilliant, right? For me as a clinician to be able to go to her and say, here's what people are telling me. You tell me how that, what's happening in the brain. And she'd be like, bip, 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 out, out it would come. <laughs> and so um, that, that is just so nice and so nice for people to hear what is actually happening that and connect their experience to the neurobiology of what's going on. That's very cool. Yeah. yeah. And it's great to see it. It's great to see it visually too. Um, like when he was saying about the want and the win for me, I still very much remember the last days of my gambling and it wasn't, I just remember sitting there like, why am I here? Why can't I leave? Like, why am I here? Why can't I leave? Like, why am I here? Why can't I leave? Like, why am I here? Why can't I leave? I don't even want to be here. I don't like gambling. I don't understand this, you know, as I'm hitting this button repeatedly. And I'm very opposite of Brian when it came to if I did win in the late hour, I was mad. I was mad that I won because I knew I wouldn't be leaving and I didn't want to be there to begin with. And it it's so crazy when you say that out loud, like who would be mad if they won a jackpot at the end of the night? Me, me, because I knew how much more of my life this was going to take. And I knew I wasn't going to leave with this money. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see that. And what I think most stuck out to me, and this is a conversation that we've kind of it's come up lately um, about car maintenance. Um, like visually when I, when you, when the part goes and the car starts to deteriorate and starts to show vis visually on the thing, that's a very true for a lot of like, like gamblers is we stop spending money on, on everyday things, car maintenance, uh, household maintenance, those types of things. Food. So food, our, our physical appearance, you know, our clothing, um, you know, just like for women, it's hair maintenance, nails, whatever. Um, and we start, we stop spending cause that that's gambling money. Like, um, and so it's like, as the depiction of, of just the deterioration of the car, of, you know, just everything it, it's, it's very symbolic to me because it's, it's very much like just the deterioration, not necessarily of, of my life, but of the things in my life, my, my vehicles, my house, um, you know, just as far as like, I've always been somebody that took pride in my home. And when my gambling took over, 
um, you know, I'd have piles of laundry everywhere and the dishes didn't get done every day and uh, dust piled up on the ceiling fans. And, you know, those, those types of things, I didn't hang pictures up. I didn't decorate those types of things. You just, they just completely go to the wayside. Like they completely just are not even in my brain. And so it's just like, I remember the very first time I watched that, that that's one of the things that stuck out to me the most is just kind of, kind of that thing. Um, what's different for me too, than a lot of people is I had a very slow burn with, with gambling. I had a 12 year history with gambling and it didn't become problematic until about seven years in, I considered myself a responsible controlled gambler until about seven months in. And I mean, seven years in, and that's when something just flipped. Like I'm I, I can kind of pinpoint it, but I kind of can't at the same time. Um, and so a lot of the stories I hear though, it's, it, it takes off like a wildfire. Um, I, I, I talked to a woman who started gambling and within 17 months um, went from a well, a, a lovely home, good job to prison. I think those are two amazing points. Um, I'm not sure if we ever talked to Iris about the idea of your life outside of the gambling falling apart too, but it's so true. I, I can think of many times when I've been running a, a, a group for our folks and people coming in with holes in their shoes, even years into, into their abstinence. And uh, I might say, maybe it's time for some shoes. Oh, I don't know if I can afford to do, oh. but you're right. Cause it, the mentality is that's my, yeah, even if I'm not gambling, that's still my gambling, but it takes a while to get back to that self-care for sure. Well, and our relationship with money and uh, yes, yes, our relationship with that. money. I'm looking forward to that being a, a video that you guys do. <laughs> Tell us how to find a relationship with money again, please. Yes. I, yeah. I can't remember if we mentioned this already, but we did include, there's a little rest stop moment too, where B just slows down and then keeps going. And that would be a moment to refuel the car, get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, whatever. Uh, but that we tried to incorporate that as well as I think Deirdre had mentioned the sign to go home, stop signs, things like that. The, the signs are always there, but whether or not you, you recognize them and, and, you know, take a break, take a rest. And that, mm -hmm. I, so I, yeah, um, that was an important part of building all these little things into the, the video too, mm -hmm. so that they're always there. But Iris, I wonder if you can speak to the telescoping phenomenon for women, that the, the gambling often happens really fast once it gets going. Uh, yeah. Am I right about that? Yeah. That's yeah, that's actually a characteristic in both uh, substance use disorders as well as in gambling disorder. You see what's called a, a telescoping effect. So in general, uh, males tend to start using substances earlier. So, for example, in their uh, teens, uh, 20s and uh, and that only see often problems in their substance use or gambling much later. Whereas women tend to start often gambling and substance use a little bit later. Uh, so not early teens, for example, looking more into the 20s uh, or a bit later, but the time from initial engagement to problematic engagement is much more shortened. Uh, and so we call that the telescoping effect. Uh, uh, it seems to somehow be accelerated in, uh, in women. That's interesting. Um, I was 28 when I started gambling uh, recreationally after my divorce and it was just social, you know, it was something to do. I didn't go to the bars uh, and it was a relatively safe place to go. I mean, there's security everywhere. You know, you didn't have to worry so much about that. So I was 28, but Brian, you were 18. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's, it's something that's often seen, like I said, both, both in substance use as well as, uh, in gambling and, and it's, uh, yeah, it is striking to, uh, and something you mentioned, Christine, as well, is that often, um, problematic use can often start with stressors too. So for example, negative events in your life going on the loss of a job or a relationship or things like that can, can instigate, can sort of sometimes put the pressure from, you know, uh, casual use or casual gambling to, uh, to more problematic gambling. I think for me, I started when I started going at 28, it was it was pretty recreational for a lot of a lot of years. But during that time, I was building some terrible coping skills. 
when stress did come up in my life. And so when I was about 35 and, uh, you know, things in my life weren't great, that's when I started to lean into the gambling more. And, and like you say, go into that zone where nothing was really just coming in at me. It was just quiet. You know, I wasn't having to focus on everything I was happy, unhappy with outside of this bubble. And it's just, it's still just so just talking about it. It, it makes me look at like something, you know, that was making my life more miserable, but I still craved yeah, it. Recognize it first. That sort of speaks to, I think people have different uh, motivations often for gambling and speaking very generally. Again, you often see uh, males reporting more, uh, more reasons for gambling, uh, underlying their gambling related to arousal. So for the excitement, for the thrill, the risk, uh, and often when women report reasons for gambling, it's sort of the dissociative aspect. It's like, you know, things in life aren't going very well. I can do this zone out, don't have to think about all the issues going on at home. And so, um, so the, the motivations make a difference then as well. And the longer people are kind of in that addictive pattern, the more de-skilled they become. So those coping skills that they used to have or maybe could develop, the gambling kind of takes over that. So they forget what they can do or they forget how to cope or they or for some people never had the opportunity to learn how to cope. And so what's left is just like in our video, what's left is just the car. And, you know, it's not like B has the ability to be a mechanic or to, you know, fix the car. He doesn't even try, right? He just keeps driving because that's all he knows at that point. Yeah. Um, You'd be surprised too, when we talk about um, how men kind of tend more for the risk of it and and women for the escape. But what I have found very surprising too lately in the communities that I I work with and um, women kind of like that risk too. You know, they kind of like, especially if like this shows up a lot when they've self-excluded from a casino and they kind of like the risk of maybe getting caught when they go back to the casino. For me, I don't want to get caught. I don't, I don't want to be in trouble that way, but for some, for some women, but it can show up in other things too. Like even in recovery, kind of like the risk of like in finances, you know, just kind of like trying to beat the bill to the uh, bank or, you know, put, get the money in before the bill hits it just kind of in different, just patterns of like trying to beat the system. And I kind of, I kind of get that a little bit of just trying to find a way to kind of like beat the system a little bit in some capacity. Um, and I'm not sure if that's related to kind of like those gambling behaviors or not, but even coming into recovery, there was still a little bit of like, how can I, I guess, look for that same reward system or that same kind of kind of feeling when you're trying to to stop well iris would you say that trying to risk say getting back in on self-exclusion or something like that would you say that that is pressing the gas pedal is that activating the reward center i think yeah i i would agree with that there's different aspects of sort of um just to to bring in some research lingo, sort of positive and negative urgency that uh, often we can think about as as sort of thrill seeking, both on a, in a negative way as well as a, a positive way. So uh, negative, so the stress of getting everything in line, so you have money to to do things, or uh, positive, even when you know when really good things happen. Sometimes you feel well, now I can celebrate. Now I can let myself go and do these things. So, so yeah, that's these- thrill seeking. So trying to trying to beat the system is a thrill seeking. That's a negative. Uh, what did you call it? A negative urgency. A negative urgency. In terms of yeah, in terms of uh, sort mm-hmm. of uh, small stressors that uh, that lead to more impulsive behaviors. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Iris, uh, I know we're we're getting close to wrapping up, but I, I wanted to ask. Um, for my own self, and I know there's people watching who also use slot machines, could you talk about losses disguised as wins and near misses? Sure. Um, so one of the things that we tried to incorporate in Brain Connections were spe- uh, looking at specific features of gambling that uh, that are being studied and how they really act to uh, to to make everyone play longer. Um, 
And I think uh, researchers are, are only getting in on this now in the past decade or so. I think casinos have known these aspects, uh, at least that they prolong play for probably way, way longer than this. So uh, losses that look like wins is uh, is one of the features that we talk about uh, on the website. Um, and this is how um, many people will know that multi-line slot machines often highlight how you win across different lines of play. So you have all sorts of bells and whistles, triumphant sounds and flashing lights. And, and these are signs that you've won. Uh, but you haven't necessarily won. You may have spent $10 to win $3 in the end. Um, the machines don't highlight your losses, though. Uh, so by presenting winning lights and sounds every time you you know press the button, it feels like you're on a winning streak. You're on this constant winning streak on a, on a slot machine. Uh, and you, you may actually and likely are steadily losing money, but you don't, you don't realize that you don't feel it. Um, and so if the machine made losing buzzer sounds each time you lost, you probably wouldn't continue to gamble for that long. If every button press you heard ah, ah, a buzzer sound, <laughs> it, uh, it would, it would change the play. It wouldn't make it fun anymore. So that's a very common um, feature on slot machines. And the other one is a, a near miss, uh, which we describe and show on the website as well, which is when you have reels showing two matching symbols, for example, and then when the third one comes down, it almost lines up to the pay line, uh, but not quite. It's sometimes the, for example, the piece of fruit may be one above or one, one below the pay line. And uh, we've now, uh, people or different researchers have studied near misses in the, the scanner and they find that um, near misses impact the body and the brain in in multiple ways. So first of all, emotionally, you feel bad um, because you almost won. There's a negative feeling that comes comes up, but you spin again because it, it feels like a win is very, very close. It's imminent at this point. Um, and in, in the brain, it turns out that your reward network fires up as if you had one because it's that, anticip it's that anticipation, it's, it's digging into the wanting part of the brain. It's like, ah! and so you feel like a win is imminent. You feel as, almost as if it was going to be rewarding, even though you actually lost. Uh, so it feels always like your chances of winning, you're improving as if you're getting closer. Uh, and so you end up spinning again. So those are fascinating. Yeah. So those are some of the, just a few features that I think <laughs> researchers are cluing in on. And there's probably many, many more that, uh, that are yet to be discovered that uh, really, it, and everyone is sensitive to these. Everyone is conditioned to, you know, certain noises, bells, whistles, you know, make us think of winning. It's a, it's a, it's something we're conditioned to from a very young age. So it taps into basic uh, aspects of associative reward of, of learning that we all have. Oh, I can remember my heart jumping out of my body so many times in the, with that anticipation. I know. I was like, when she was describing that, I'm like, yes. And then it's like, I kept would tell myself it's going to hit, it's going to hit the machine's going to hit because it's doing this, it's doing this, it's doing this like repeatedly. And then most times it never did. But for some reason, I, I was able to convince myself that because it was so close that it meant that it was going to eventually come around, right? Eventually line up. And, and I think that's an important distinction that you've, you've described in different ways uh, that, that researchers have started to hone in on as well. So separating the outcome from the anticipation and, and it's actually the anticipation that, it, that has everything riding on it because that happens right before you make a choice that happens right before you decide to push the button or decide to lay more money down etc and that's why anticipation is one of the cruxes i would say of of uh, substance use disorders and, and gambling disorders because uh if your anticipation is 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 off in some way in predicting things or it's stimulated uh artificially by these machines uh you you will be extremely tempted to make poor choices yeah. Um, wow. I'm, I'm just so in awe in this conversation. It's just, it's been like absolutely mind blowing to me. Um, sorry. Uh, Birdie just decided to make an appearance. Uh, so she, she's making sure that, uh, we're on target here. 
Deirdre, was there anything else that we should talk about prior to coming to a close? Um, one thing I would say, just and not even about the video, but just if, if listeners out there or our viewers, I guess, um, are feeling or know that they have a concern, it's important to reach out for help. Um, unfortunately, this is a very stigmatized problem. There's a lot of shame that goes with it. It's the number one reason people don't seek help is because they feel shame about it. So, uh, so shout out to anybody who's thinking, oh, maybe I should get help. Please do. <laughs> Please connect with your local counseling center, your family doctor in Ontario connects. Uh, there's free counseling across our country for gambling problems. Don't hesitate. Um, you know, counseling can really, really help. And, um, and there's no shame in this, right? There are reasons that these things happen. There's always reasons, always valid reasons. So, um, um, yeah, that would be my message at the end of all this is make sure you get the help you need. And are helplines in Canada broken down by province? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have each province has its own strategy, right, Iris? It, it's yeah. um, that's just the way that it is. Yeah. And any final words from you, Dr. Belotus? Um, no, I just, yeah, I can just very generally summarize that it's, you know, knowledge translation is a, is such an important thing to happen now with gambling research being where it's at and having people connect the, you know, the researchers and the clinicians. And, uh, it, it really is a bi-directional relationship. So as much as Deirdre asks me stuff, I, I get so much information from her at, you know, from what's going on at the front lines and different experiences and, uh, of individuals. And it's, uh, you know, this type of work I think is, is so important, um, and um, we, we would love to do more. We'd love to do an eight part series and, uh, and <laughs> get it. Out. I hope you do. I absolutely <laughs> hope you do. Yeah. Well, These if there are funders adventures. out there, if there are funders out there, we'd love to do <laughs> cannabis and gambling. We'd love to do what else would we like to do? Here? Yeah, there's yes. So many, uh, topics that that we could look at. Gaming and, and gambling. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you will never be bored in your work, which is a good thing. <laughs> That's true. Well, uh, Iris and Deirdre, thank you so much for joining us on The Bet Free Life. Uh, go to brainconnections.ca to see the video or to get more information. And can they find both of you if they wanted to get a hold of you on the website? Yes, yeah. they can. Yep. Perfect. Well, for Christina, I'm Brian. Thank you for watching.